In this tutorial, I'm going to cover the four standard redshift lights, how to use them and how to begin rendering with them. The four standard lights are direction light, spotlight, point light, and an area light. And if you used Maya before and you've inserted lights and rendered, then you probably already heard of these lights. However, instead of using the Maya lights, redshift comes with its own set of the standard four lights that are very similar to the Maya ones. So you never want to use the Maya lights if you're rendering with Redshift because Redshift has its own that you should use. So to get access to these four standard lights, go to the Redshift tab and it's going to be this first icon, this yellow icon right here. And if you right click on it, you have access to these four standard lights, area light, point, spot, and directional. Now many of these lights have very similar properties between each other. So if you cover one, they translate to the other ones. So there's going to be some crossover between all of these lights. But I'm going to start with the directional light first. So right click on this icon to get access to more and choose the directional light. Whenever I insert a light, I usually try to scale it up so I can find it inside the scene easier. By default, it comes in very small. And if you scale the light, make it larger, it does not affect its intensity except for one light, which is going to be the area light. If you scale the area light, it does affect its intensity, but your direction light, your spotlight and your point light do not. So I'm going to hit R and just scale this light and just move it back. When it comes to the direction light, where you place this light doesn't matter. Think of the direction light as the sun and only the angle in which it shines onto the scene matters. But where it appears in the scene, has no relationship to the intensity of it and to the objects. It's basically an infinity light. And just think of it as it's your sun, your sun or your moon. And you should only have one of these inside the scene. So the only thing we need to do is we need to rotate it and position it so it just shines onto our scene better. So I'm going to hit E for rotate and just angle it down and maybe give it a bit of an angle to the side. To get access to the properties to change for any light, you'll find them inside the attribute editor. So if you come over here, go to attribute editor, open this up, you will have your standard controls for changing the properties for that selected light. If you don't see it when you switch over to the attribute editor, you may need to make sure that you have the proper tab selected. You might be here or some other tab. So just make sure you switch over to the right one. And let's go ahead and render. Come over here. Left click to open up your render view and you'll probably have nothing here. This is one of my, this is uh, the previous quick render shot that I did of the same scene. So usually you'll have nothing here. So to render your first shot from the perspective viewport, just left click on this render icon and this will render uh, whatever you're looking at in the perspective viewport. So by default, your directional light is going to come in very intense. So the first thing you should change is the intensity. If you come over here in the attribute editor, you're going to find the intensity value right here, intensity multiplier. So 100 is very strong and you may want to go ahead and change it down to one. That's more of a reasonable value to use. So I'm going to change it to one and we render your frame. And here we have uh, our first rendered scene with the direction light. So in order to get more of a sunlight kind of uh, effect from your direction light, you have to change your color, adjust the intensity and just kind of find the right values between the two. Those are usually the go-to when you're setting up your sunlight, your directional light. When it comes to color, you have an option. You can choose to control the color itself by left clicking on this color icon and then choosing the color of your light. So let's say if I wanted to have a little bit more warmer effect, just choose the color and then re-render your scene. Or you can choose to use temperature by changing the mode from color to temperature. This will give you access to temperature controls and you can input a value from zero to 10,000. And there's a very useful color temperature chart that you can use. So this basically takes a real world accurate value and gives you an output of a color, color temperature. So you can use one or the other and you can see that if you choose one, the color is grayed out. And if you choose color, the temperature is going to be grayed out. So if you choose temperature and use any of those values from the chart, and just say, uh, let's say we want a warmer morning or evening sky color. So let's tap in 5,000 and we render our scene. Uh, if we go even lower, let's do 3,500 and we render it. 
it's gonna give you that warmer look and if you want more of a cooler blue overcast or a midday type of lighting just go up let's do 8000 and re-render so you can use one or the other there is another option to go between temperature and color together so basically it gives you access to both you can change color and temperature and you combine between the two and it's almost like mixing uh, whatever temperature you set and the color that you apply I don't use this I use one or the other but I don't tend to use both of them at the same time but if you choose to you can experiment with this so let me go ahead and switch back to color and just choose maybe a different uh, warmer let's do more yellow and let's do a render now it's a little bit too dark in here so let's go ahead and increase our intensity let's maybe go up to three and re-render. So those are the only values that you need to change under intensity properties to kind of get started with your direction light. The other one we want to take a look at is the sh shadows. So let's go ahead and uh, scroll down and open up the shadows. So shadows allow you to control the shadow transparency, softness, and the uh, quality of your shadows. So you can change the transparency and I'm going to go ahead and enable my IPR so you can see it in real time. So it updates. So if you change the transparency, basically sets the opacity for the cast shadows. So you can change that and you can also do softness, which gives you a softer effect to the cast shadows. So right now our shadows are way too hard, way too harsh and have a hard edge all around. So in order to get more soft effect to them, just increase the softness effect. And you can see it's beginning to soften out. Actually, if uh, so you can push the slider up to two, but sometimes you need to go more. So let me, let me go up to five and let it render. You can see it gets a little softer. And the beauty of this is, is because the way redshift works is the contact right at the source is very hard, very hard edge, like you would usually see in real life. And then it begins to soften as it transitions away. And the further shadows usually have a softer edge. And wherever there is a contact, usually there is a hard edge. And if you zoom in a little closer, we see uh, we could have a little bit of noise here. And usually you do have it in the shadows. So you can increase the samples in order to remove some of that shadow noise. And that's where you apply it. So 8 is usually very small, very low. But you can increase it to increase the shadow quality. Now the sample count applies only to the shadows. But there is also a sample quality that you can increase for overall scene. And you can do this inside the render settings. If you open this up, go to output, and you can increase the max sample count. So this will apply to the entire scene, shadows and everything else included. So this will also increase the quality of your renders. So if you have some noise, you can increase this value right here on the unified sample and max samples, you just go up. And I usually just uh, increase it in the power of two until I get good results. But if you want to just control it per light and how it affects the shadows themselves for only specific lights, you just you can uh, mess around with this value and just keep increasing it until you get a good results as well. Another useful property, so when you select the light, every light will have ability to turn off shadows. So you can kind of maybe focus on the light or maybe you don't want the light to have any shadows and maybe it's a, some kind of a fake bounce light that you're doing and you're trying to affect the scene but not have that light cast any shadows. So this is where you turn that off. And if you want to turn off the light completely and work on certain lights at a time, just come over on the general and if you disable this, this will turn off that light. And then when you're done, you can re-enable it and turn it back on. So this is very useful when you have many lights and you just want to kind of focus in and just tweak one light at a time and see what it does. So these are the main properties you want to control and change for your direction light. The second light we're going to cover is the point light. So let's go ahead and insert it. Again, redshift tab, right click on the first icon, that's yellow, which is going to be the fifth one down, and uh, choose your point light. And again, I'm going to go ahead and scale it. The scale for this one also does not matter, does not increase the intensity of it, just makes it larger in the viewport. And I'm just going to position it right there. Your point light is a light bulb. It will emit light in all six directions. Up, down, left, right, front and back. So let's go ahead and render with the default settings. Bring up the render view and hit the render. 
and right away you're going to see that this light, its intensity needs to be increased. So let's adjust our settings. Come over to the attribute editor again, open that up, and you're going to have pretty much the same settings as you did for the direction light. The only property we need to adjust right now is increase the intensity multiplier. So the direction light we had to bring it down to 1, but when we are working with a point light, we need to increase this way higher. So if I bring it up, I'm going to bump it up very high. And let's do it to 1000. Go ahead, enter, and rerun the reframe. And it will take more of an effect inside that scene. The distance that you have this light next to our other objects matters. So the further it is away, the less effect it will take on some of the objects around it. So just give it a, uh, give it a moment so it renders. So if I drag it away even further, it will shine less. So the position has a lot to do with the point light. The further it is away, the less effect it will take to light the objects around it. And the closer it is, the more effect it will illuminate the objects around it as well. Let's go ahead and increase the intensity even more so we can see a lot better. Let's uh, go up to 5000 and re-render. So we have very similar settings as we did for the direction light. We have our mode, color or temperature. So let's just uh, change our color. So uh, make it a little bit more blue and re-render. So you can change color, you can change your intensity. Uh, you also have controls for shadows and these are the same type of controls that you saw on the uh, direction light. You can uh, adjust the softness to it. Now we can't really see, so let me bump it up even higher to uh, 10,000. Let's re-render so we have more shadows and more intensity of the light. So you, you can increase the intensity of how soft those shadows are. It's kind of hard to tell because it's uh, very dark and we only have one of these lights. But basically it works the same way as the direction light. You will have some softness applied to the end of it so uh, as it begins to taper off further away from the object. Then you have your transparency. Let me go ahead and enable IPR so we can adjust in real time. And as well as change the intensity. So IPR is really helpful because you can see everything change as you work on your scene. So let me go ahead and just bring this back down. And there's not that many more settings we need to cover because some of these are the same. Uh, you just have to know that the, the distance of this direction light matters. So the further or closer it is away from the objects, you will light it up more and affect the scene more. The one property we do want to take a look at is the decay. Uh, you don't really want to change this. The decay is basically the time and the distance at which the light begins to die out and not affect the scene. So the distance of this, the further it is away, there is a certain time and distance that it affects the scene before the light no longer hits the further objects as it gets further away from them. So if you want to change the type, you can. This will drastically affect at which distance and how long that light lives on inside the scene. So this is why you don't really want to change this. And inverse square is the closest to real world values you can get. It gives you a real representation of what a light would do in the real world. So I usually don't want to change this, but it's nice to know that it's there. And of course, for some of the point lights, sometimes you may want to disable shadows for some of them. So this is where the shadow control becomes more important than it is for the direction light when you enable or disable it. So sometimes you just don't want a specific point light to have any cast shadows. Let's say you're just trying to uh, fake some bounce lighting or something else. So that really helps. And as well as you can turn it on and off. Just like you can with the direction light. And again, many of these properties will be the same from light to light. So there'll be a lot of crossover. And that's pretty much it for the point light. The third light is a spotlight. Let's go ahead and insert it and take a look at the properties. I'm going to go ahead and make it larger so we can see inside the scene. Again, for this third light, the size of it inside the scene, when you scale it, and its effect and its intensity does not matter. It just makes it easier for us to see it and select it. So a spotlight acts like a spotlight would. It has a single direction, a cone, to produce the spotlight effect, and it dies off at a certain distance from its light source. So what we need to do is we need to angle it first in order to shine a spotlight effect onto a scene. 
So I'm just going to go ahead and rotate it down, position it, and move it. And let's go ahead and do a render. So just like the point light, the intensity is very low. So we need to adjust it. I'm going to go ahead and hit IPR so we can see it in real time. And to go to attribute editor. And the first thing we need to adjust is the intensity. So 100 is way too low. Let's go ahead and just bump it up to 5000. And as soon as you do that, you will begin to see it take effect. And actually for the spotlight, let's go even higher. Let's go to 25,000. It's kind of hard to see. So I'm going to maybe position it inside the scene more and just kind of drag it so we can see it better. So you can see it applies a spotlight effect onto the scene. Now, just like the point light, the distance matters. So the further you are away, and I might have to be a little further, uh, it begins to fall off and die off at a certain distance. So you still have the decay, just like you do for the point light, which is set to the same type. So that distance from the objects matters. So I'm not going to change the decay. I'm going to leave it at default, uh, just so you know just like the point light. So I'm going to bring it back a little closer so it uh, intensifies and illuminates the scene more. And let's zoom in. Now you have the rest of the controls just like you do for the directional light and the point light. You have your on and off. You have your color and temperature. You can choose a different color. So let's just uh, change it to something else. You have your intensity multiplier is what we just changed. You have your decay that we just covered. And of course, uh, you have your shadow controls. So nothing new here. There is a certain set of properties that is just applicable to the spotlight. And you're going to find it underneath this tab right here, spot. Go ahead and open this up. And you're going to have three properties to control. The first one is the cone angle. So this will increase the effect of the spotlight and make the effect of it wider. So the cone angle can be increased to affect a larger area. And then you have two other controls for fall off angle. You have fall off angle and curve. So if you adjust this, you almost have like a, an inner cone angle for a softer transition where the light begins and where it begins to taper off. So if you decrease it, it'll give you a harder shadow where the light begins and there's no fall off angle at all. And you can increase it. And then you have the fall off curve, which controls the curve of the fall off. So I'll change it back to one. So you adjust the cone angle, how wide do you want this to be? And then you adjust the fall off of the effect. And then maybe after the fact, maybe you need to adjust the fall off curve. So just only three properties to affect the spotlight and how it looks inside the scene. And other than that, the rest of the properties are pretty much standard for all the other lights. And you just adjust the color, intensity, and then you come over here to the spotlight uh, area and adjust it for the spotlight. And then of course you can adjust the shadows. And usually you would want to adjust the softness. So that's why I keep coming back to the shadow area because the shadow softness has a lot to do with uh, making more believable scenes. Because you rarely have a very hard shadow all the way around. So you do have to control some softness to it to make it more believable. And the fourth slide we're going to cover is the area light. Area light is a more special light than the other three lights as it has a few properties that the others do not have. So let's go ahead and insert that area light. Again, I'm going to right click on this icon and insert the area light. The area light is the only light out of the four where if you scale the light, it will also change its intensity and the area of effect. Let's go ahead and render our frame. And you can see right away it's taking effect, but it's very small and it's not that intense and it isn't affecting a larger area. So we can do one of two things. We can increase the size of the area light or we can control its intensity or we can do both. So let me go ahead and actually scale this light first. I'm going to enable IPR. So we render in real time. Hit R for scale and start scaling. And as soon as you do that, you can see that the intensity of the light increases. I push it back and just uh, position it. And let's scale it again. And the more I scale, the more intense it becomes. 
I can also come over here and we can adjust the intensity. Open up the attribute editor and change the intensity multiplier. Let's say 500. So you have two properties you can control. The size to affect more of your scene as well as the intensity multiplier. Of course you have all the other options here as well which uh, we don't need to cover because you already know them since we covered in other lights. Now this area light has a direction that it's pointing and you can see that it has this line. This is the direction of the light source where it's going to point. You can of course rotate the light in addition to moving and scaling. And let me reset this back to 100. You will also notice that the area light has a shape. And right now we're looking at the shape, uh, the light source, where the light is coming from. And the larger you make it, the larger it becomes in the scene. And this light you can see. Now if you want to change not just the width and the height altogether, you can uh, just adjust it and make it more narrow, make it wider, non-uniformly. So this is great for if you want to shine some light through a window or maybe you're creating a specific light source that has more of a rectangular shape. You can do this with an area light. Now if you want to have the area light but not want to see it inside the scene, you can actually disable this visibility of it inside the render by coming over into the attribute editor, into the properties, open up the area property tab. This is where you have additional properties just for the area light. And then here you have visible. So when you turn this off, the light is still shining and affecting the scene, but you just don't see the shape of it. You can also make it bi-directional, which will shine in both directions, front and back. So you'll see it right here. In the back, you will also have this light, as opposed to if you turn this off, it'll just go into one direction. Another useful property is you can change the shape of this light. So right now we're looking at the square, or maybe it is a more rectangular light, depending on how you scale it. But right here under shape, you can change it to a disc, sphere, cylinder, or you can assign a mesh to it. So if I had the mesh inside the scene, I could just assign it and it will use that mesh as the light source. And since I already have two objects right here, let's uh, find something a little bit more interesting. Um, let's, uh, let me create a different polygonal primitive. Let's do, let's do a helix. Let's make it larger. And I can assign this mesh to illuminate the scene instead of uh, the shape, whatever it gives me. So the way you do this is you select the mesh first. And then you select the light second. And then when you come over to the shape, change to mesh. Actually, it won't do anything right now is because we need to link it. So the object needs to be selected first, the light second, and then you link. And then it will basically take the mesh that you want you assign to it and use it as a light source. And then when you want to unlink it, just click on link with this, with this mesh selected. So again, the way you do this is come over to the light, switch shape to mesh, then select the mesh first, Hold shift, the light second, click link, and now you have that mesh as your light source. Very cool and very unique to the area light. And let me go ahead and unlink it. And let's change it back to rectangle. So the rest of the properties, like I said, uh, you have all the rest of the properties that, that are the same across all other lights. You have color, you have a mode for temperature color, and of course you have shadow controls. And by default, you'll notice that the area light already has soft shadows that it's producing. So you don't really have to set too much in the shadow area other than transparency. Uh, as you can see, the other options are disabled. So area light is a great light to use. And of course, in addition to other lights, when you combine them all to use together, then you can create more unique scene depending on what you are creating. And the last part I want to cover is just a general overview of uh, just working with lights, how to delete them, how to rename them, and how to even convert them. So of course you can have more than one light inside the scene. We just covered them all one by one, but you can have multiple area lights, multiple spotlights, multiple point lights, as well as mixing them all together. So you can take your light and if you want to duplicate your light, you just simply select it 
and hit Control D to duplicate. And in this case, I also duplicated this mesh. So let's just delete them. Let me go ahead and re-enable IPR. So now you have a second light. Maybe you want to insert a third light, but in this case, maybe you want to have a point light. Go ahead and insert it, scale it so we can see it. In this case, it's not going to affect the scene. Uh, maybe position it back here, change the color uh, to something else. And increase the intensity because the point light naturally is very low intensity. And you can just combine multiple lights together. The only light you want to have one of is the direction light. You should not have multiple direction lights. It's like having multiple suns. Direction light is the only light you should have one of, but the rest of the lights you can duplicate and have as many as you need. To delete any light, just select it and hit delete. And it will be gone. If you want to have your light, but you want to rename it, let's say I have this uh, every light, let me duplicate it one more time. If you want to rename it, just select the light, come over here into the top right here and it'll say RS Area Light Shape 2. What you actually want to rename it is you want to switch over to channel box and rename it here. And use the channel box to re rename lights rather than that property that you saw there. And then here you can type in uh, area light and let's say it's, uh, I don't know, large room. I usually try to leave RS, that stands for redshift. So that way I know I have a redshift light. And then I usually name it. Uh, sometimes I keep the name of what type of light this is as well. Maybe abbreviate it. But this is how you rename it. Uh, you can also rename it inside the outliner. Open up the outliner. Find the light. Double click on it. And rename it here. And of course you can delete your lights from the outliner as well. So select it. And hit delete. And one more thing is you can convert existing lights to another type of light. I don't do this very often because it keeps the same name and it might even keep some of the properties from the light you had before. So I don't like the way it does it, but you could still do this. So select the light, go into the attribute editor. And if you come over here on the general, you have light type. Right now it's set to area. You can convert it to any type of light, let's say spotlight. So you can see it converted it, but the problem is a uh, that I don't like it keeps the same name. So you would have to rename it right away. And also it will keep the properties that you have. So let's say if I had this set to uh, 10,000 or maybe even more, let's do 100,000 for a spotlight. And then I went ahead and converted it to something else such as back to area light. It keeps the same intensity. So I don't, I'm not a fan of doing this and I just like to insert a light that I'm going to use and not convert it but you do have that option. And that is it. Those are your four standard redshift lights that you can use to create and light your scene with. And there are additional lights inside redshift and they are right here. You have your portal light, IES light, dome light, and sun and sky. As well as if you go to the redshift on the lights, you have redshift physical light. So there are more than four, but these are your kind of basic standard lights that you should know how to use. And I hope this tutorial was helpful to get you started with the four standard redshift lights.